GitLamp is in the running to be the last package I create for one of my media projects. However, I did put my all into it when I put it together back in 2009. The packaging is a slipcase for the two DVDs, and the outside is meant to be a little dull, a little off-putting, black and white. And when you open it, a beautiful mural made by Lucas Kettner is inside. The slipcase can be undone. You can pull the tab that forms it out. And written on the tab in tiny, tiny letters is the poem from which the words A Mind Forever Voyaging came from. That's something a few people figured out when they were playing around with the package and occasionally they would bring it up with me. But there's a second little feature hidden away in the packaging. If for some reason, and what reason would you have, you pulled apart the outside slipcover, actually causing the glue to come apart, you would find under the glue yet another bunch of writing. It's an Indonesian riddle, a pretty bird, with gold on its nose and its tail dipped in a lake. Nobody, nobody has ever brought me that information on their own. It was an enormous effort to have it done. The printer really argued with me and told me it was dangerous to the structural integrity of the package to have printing under the glue. But I insisted and even though nobody has ever brought it up with me in ten years, I wouldn't have done a single thing differently. So here's some thoughts on whimsy. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Peter Healy, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere, who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. What I'm describing when I talk about whimsy is a philosophy and an outlook in life. It's not something that people will necessarily agree with, and I certainly in no way think it's the only outlook people should have. But I have found it incredibly rewarding to be one of the people who goes that extra little bit, not just in terms of obvious quality or making things feel or work better. I think that's worth doing no matter what. But working hard on a side aspect, a different related project that itself may never be revealed or only be revealed to a tiny fraction of people who don't know the effort that led to it is to my thinking, incredibly satisfying. Multiple times in my life, I've run into this outlook, or more accurately, the result of it. And every time, I have been truly delighted. Maybe it's because I'm deeply aware of life's one-way nature, that you pass many places only once. And yet, while you can't travel back in time, you can leave messages and notes that tell others that you were here once. Sure, you can take photos, you can leave graffiti, you can damage things so that you're awake, but I'm talking about a subtle, beautiful thing. I'll see a story where an artist stayed in hotel rooms and painted a small scene underneath paintings in the room and then covered them up again unsure how many years would pass before they'd ever be seen again. Or maybe in ANSI art, where some of the artists would put black text on a black background and leave other messages in the drawings, and you would have to convert the entire drawing over to a monochrome color to find them. There have been messages inside of ROM chips, symbols inside of paintings, or even an interesting name for a Wi-Fi hotspot that catches everyone's attention when they're looking for somewhere to log in. Back in the long-ago era, 
where I got to decide on host names. I always tried to have a lot of fun with that. Four machines had been built for one customer. Four, aft, bow, and stern. And a year later, they let me name the next four, which I happily gave the names of Mutiny, Scurvy, Brig, and Poop Deck, although that last one was changed within a few days. Whimsy can be barely perceptible, where you don't even know if this was done on purpose, or it can be so overt it catches you completely off guard. When I visited Marvin of Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum, a place which was incredibly special, full of models and machines and video games, old and new, there was a back area, and along one hallway, there was a poster there, a little ways up so that the kids couldn't reach it, with a picture of Burt Reynolds. This was his centerfold that he had done stretched out on a rug, and there was a wooden flap over his bathing suit area, which, if you felt the curiosity, you could lift up. But if you did that, if you lifted up the little flap, a shrieking, honking buzzer would go off throughout the entire arcade, and two large pointing fingers would light up above your head. This outlook, this way of looking at things, this is, like I said, not for everybody. I'm not trying to get people who don't find this worth the time to start doing it, as if it's some sort of requirement to achieve a new level of existence. It's nothing like that. It's just me saying that for other people who find amusement and wonder when this sort of thing happens, that they are absolutely not alone. Perhaps the most whimsical thing I ever heard of was a book that came out in the 1890s who time-traveled to London and took a book out of a library to get information they desperately needed from the future. This 1890s book was incredibly detailed as to what day, what time, and where the book was located. So, in the 1990s, in this library in London, on the day that this story said a traveler would show up, there were a number of people sitting around the reading room. They weren't looking at books. They weren't otherwise being patrons. They would side glance at each other, and they all slowly realized that they were all folks who, just feeling the pull, the possibility, had come to this library just to see what would happen at exactly that time. And the time grew closer until eventually the clock on the wall was the exact moment that the story a hundred years ago had mentioned. And suddenly, a person came into the reading room, dressed perfectly in the costume of a hundred years ago. And he looked around quickly, walked over to the shelf, took out a very specific book, and quickly hurried outside of the reading room. The people who were there, who were fascinated at the idea of being around a hundred years in the future, to a predicted minute, I think, found the greatest reward for that sort of curiosity. There's another hundred-year whimsy like this that we're living through. An Easter egg was buried in a game called Trials, and when everybody solved it, it turned out that they had released a box being given to a legal firm, and that legal firm is now holding this box for 100 years, the idea being that everyone who played the game will be gone. It will be completely up to a century from now exactly how they treat the news of this box being available. The people who have the keys have to hand them to descendants to have any chance of the box being opened. Now, time capsules are, we know, created for the times they are buried, much more than the times when they are opened. That's been proven 
over and over again. But still, the idea of throwing something into the future and not knowing how it'll land, especially something concocted out of fantasy and whimsy, is at least worth the shot. And I'll leave this meandering episode with a basic concept. I think that whimsy is such a fragile light, such a low-burning flame in the wind of daily life, that it needs a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of fuel to really continue to survive. So consider what I'm talking about, to be laying a few embers down for a few people who hear this podcast now or a hundred years from now, to go that extra 10, 20, 50 percent in effort, to lay down a foundation that they don't know anyone will ever stand on, that they don't know if anyone will ever really understand, whose context may be long lost. But like a lucky throw from a moving train that is our one-way trip through life, it might land just right. And that glow will change someone's life. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Forrest Fuqua, Corey Thomas, Matt Reynolds, and Emilio Oliveira, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. A pretty bird with gold on its nose and a tail dipped in a lake. An oil lamp.